and we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I want to say good evening, everyone. I want to thank everyone here for joining um, the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference and the Chicago Hyde Park Village for this community dialogue and kickoff event um, for the Dementia Friendly Hyde Park Initiative. Uh, my name is Ali Amora. I am the president of the board of the Hyde Park Kenwood Community uh, Conference. Um, we, uh, the, the conference is, is honored and very pleased to be organizing this community dialogue tonight in collaboration with the Chicago Hyde Park Village um, and all the folks who help make this event possible for tonight. Um, we're going to get a chance to, uh, to see some of those folks um, and we'll be uh, recognizing them by name throughout the night. Um, I want everyone to please note that this event is being recorded. Um, and we are live streaming this, or we will be live streaming this very shortly on Facebook. Um, and, uh, you know, for the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference, um, this is the, the second of our community dialogues in 2021. Um, you know, since, since the pandemic has, has uh, kind of, you know, been around us, we have been doing these community forums as a way to get us all together. Um, and we are very excited for all of us tonight to, to learn about and to share about this dementia friendly initiative in Hyde Park and hopefully get some questions answered and get some good information. Um, and once again, thank you all for taking the time to be with us tonight, um, including those of you who are joining us uh, in our forums for the very first time. Welcome and welcome to for those who are joining us uh, for your second or, or, or your second time or more. Uh, before we begin, I just want to take a quick minute to tell you a little bit about um, the organization that I'm here representing, the Hyde Park Kenwood Community hey, Richard, Conference. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry, Barbara, you're, I think we all can hear you. Gotcha. Um, all right. So um, HPKCC, Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference, those of you who, who aren't familiar, is an independent community organization founded in 1949. And our mission is to connect people in a diverse, green, and safe community. You know, we convene groups and individuals to network and build community around multi-generational activities, community resources, and major issues that affect our future. Our continuing goal at HPKCC is to meet the needs of our ever-changing community. Um, and so, as I mentioned, approximately over the last year, um, we have held um, uh, 10 community virtual events. We've attracted hundreds of folks on Zoom and on Facebook Live. And you can view all of these on our website um, and on our YouTube channel. And HPKCC's website is very easy to remember. It's www.hydepark.org. Um, and so tonight's community dialogue on the Dementia Friendly Hyde Park um, Initiative is a continuation of that community building and information sharing that have occurred during our previous events. So we welcome everyone and again, welcome you to visit our website, hydepark.org, become a member as well. We'd love to have you. Um, so now I wanna quickly run through our schedule. Um, so first, um, we're gonna hear a brief welcome um, uh, from Michelle Dassinger, uh, the uh, executive director of the Hi Chicago Hyde Park Village. Um, and then she's going to introduce our first speaker, uh, Wade Self, um, who is a postdoctoral uh, scholar at the University of Chicago in the neurobiology department. He's going to give us an overview of the dementia-friendly Hyde Park. Um, and then we're going to transition into a panel discussion. Um, we have a, a few invited guests. Um, Wade will be introducing them uh, when we get to the panel. Um, and then we're going to follow that panel discussion with a moderated question and answer session. So a quick note on the questions. Um, we'll begin um, with uh, questions. Some of the questions we had were submitted in advance. So thank you, those of you who have submitted advanced questions. We'll start with those. And then we're going to move on um, to questions live. So for those of you who are here, we're going to give you the opportunity if you want to ask questions or make comments um, to do so. Um, if you are interested in that, we want you to either um, raise your hands um, and uh, there, and if you go under, um, I think it is going to be uh, under participants, but there's a way to raise your hand um, under the chat function and we have to figure out um, how to do that, but we can get to that when we um, get to the questions. Um, and 
uh, you can either raise your hand to speak live or you can ask a question in the chat. We're gonna be monitoring the chat the entire time. We'll call on you and participants who wish to ask live questions or comments will be given one to two minutes only, just so we can accommodate everybody who's here. We can't guarantee that we're gonna get to everyone's question, but we're gonna try our very best to do so. As a reminder for all of our participants, please remember this is a public forum. Out of respect for everyone here, you know, we ask, we use appropriate language, um, keep the questions and comments on the topic at all times. Um, and HPKCC, we do, reserves the right to mute or remove participants if, if there are inappropriate comments or comments that just uh, don't relate. So please keep that in mind. Um, we're very happy to have you all here. And as a reminder, we are recording and live streaming this um, event. And so without further ado, I would like to bring on uh, Michelle Dassinger from the Chicago Hyde Park Village. Thank you, Ali. Um, my name is Michelle Dassinger. I'm the executive director of Chicago Hyde Park Village, also known as CHPV. CHPV is a grassroots organization based here in Hyde Park with programs and support services for older adults. We aspire to create an age-friendly, inclusive, and caring community to support vibrant, healthy aging. Last year, with support from the SHARE Network and the Memory Center at the University of Chicago Medical Center, CHPV led the effort to designate Hyde Park as Chicago's first dementia-friendly community. We're now among 17 dementia-friendly communities in Illinois and several hundred nationwide. I want to acknowledge and thank my colleague Dorothy Pytel for her dedicated work on the application last summer and her continued focus on developing this initiative. Dementia-friendly communities work to raise awareness and reduce the stigma associated with dementia and support those who are affected by dementia. A dementia-friendly community is one in which every part of the community works together to create a dementia-friendly culture. In Hyde Park, we received letters of support for our application from 12 community organizations and five elected officials. We have formed an advisory committee composed of family and friends of people living with dementia and an action team with representatives of multiple community sectors to develop the direction of dementia-friendly Hyde Park. The community forum tonight is our first public event and I thank you all for being here and showing your support for this important work. As this is a new community project, we are very interested in hearing your ideas. If you have suggestions for future projects or programs, please put them in the chat during the program. Through previous publicity about Dementia Friendly Hyde Park, we have already recruited some amazing volunteers and supporters. One of those amazing volunteers is Wade Self. Um, as Ali mentioned, he's a scientist at the University of Chicago. Um, and I now invite Wade to get our program started with an introduction to dementia. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I am really excited to be here with you all today on behalf of Dementia Friendly Hyde Park, where I'm really excited to have this discussion where we can all come together as a community to impact people's lives for those that are living with dementia. And what I'm going to do today is give a brief introduction about what is dementia and tell you a little bit about my personal story. Of, of why dementia is such an important topic to me. Um, I am sharing my screen now. Um, can I get a, head, a heads up from someone to see? Okay, great. Um, and as, as Michelle said, I am, I'm a scientist at the University of Chicago. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist in particular, and I've dedicated my career to understanding at the microscopic level what is going on in the brain in disease states that are called dementia? And like many that are here on the call, I've chosen to do what I do because of a personal experience. And that personal experience in my life has been experienced through my grandfather, Dick Kerner's battle with dementia specifically with Alzheimer's disease. He was diagnosed in, in 2009 after starting to show symptoms in 2007. And he played a tremendously influential role in my life. 
um, where I tried my best while he was around to emulate him any way that I could. And my grandfather, he was a fighter. He was the first athletic director and football coach at Wabonzi Valley High School in Naperville, Illinois. And he took that fighter mentality from being a coach to his battle uh, with dementia, with Alzheimer's disease. And uh, that battle, he fought for over 12 years, and he was actually able uh, to see me receive my PhD in 2018, over a decade after initially showing symptoms of dementia. But shortly after that time where he was able to see me present my work, um, my grandfather had an event at home where he fell down the stairs in his house. And it resulted in a rapid progression of his cognitive decline and a realization from our family that he was no longer to, to live independently in his home, the, the place that he had called home for over 50 years with my grandmother. And we were able to have him live in a community in St. Charles called the Silverado Memory Care Community. Um, and he fought valiantly to the end for a year in Silverado. And we had the chance to meet others living with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Um, you see Jeff and Charlotte here in the picture as well as their family. And what we realized as we were all experiencing this together is that dementia does not only affect the person that is living with the disease. It affects that entire support group around the person that is fighting this disease. And in the case of my family, we saw the toll it took on my grandmother, who was the primary caregiver for my grandfather for all those years. And we actually lost her in August, 2020, a year after my grandfather. And we couldn't ignore the, the physical toll that, that that stress of being the primary giver for my grandfather took on her own decline in health. Um, I saw my parents and myself and my cousin as, as grandchildren, the ones who had to lead stressful schedules to try to accommodate, to help in any way we can for my grandfather living with Alzheimer's disease. And that's what I hope that we can get out of this initiative of Dementia Friendly Hyde Park, where we can make the community a better place for families like mine and the people that you are going to hear in this discussion today, our speakers, um, to make it an equitable community for the people that are living with dementia in Hyde Park and also their families and support system. So I've tried to be careful in not confusing or associating just Alzheimer's disease with dementia, trying to be as specific as I can because dementia is actually an umbrella term that, um, that encompasses multiple uh, progressive neurodegenerative diseases um, that result in a loss of memory or other cognitive abilities that are severe enough to interfere with your everyday life. So we all are mostly familiar with Alzheimer's disease, but other disorders such as Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, and frontal temporal dementia, and also combinations of, of those disorders are other types of dementia that a person can live with. And we currently right now are on a virtual call and we are living through the COVID pandemic. And one of the fears that I have is actually that our next pandemic may be due to disorders uh, associated with dementia. So if we look at some of the numbers in the United States here, um, Last year, almost 6 million individuals were living with dementia with a cost of over $300 billion to our healthcare system. If things don't change and things progress, that number could double over the next 30 years and be associated with over $1 trillion in healthcare costs 
uh, in the United States only. But we also see that trend globally as well, where it could be projected in the next 30 years, almost 150 million people around the world could be living with dementia. And even though I've described how dementia uh, describes multiple types of disorders, um, there are some commonalities that, that occur in these disease states as we've actually, through decades of research, understood what is going on in the brain in these diseases, although there's still a lot to be discovered. Um, as in this example of Alzheimer's disease, the symptoms that are presented um, in someone living with dementia, that decline in cognition, um, is due to the loss of neurons in the brain. As you see here to the right, a much smaller brain in the Alzheimer's disease as opposed to our uh, normal, uh, healthy brain. Um, and the symptoms that are presented uh, in these different dementias are a result of different areas of the brain being first affected. And those neurons that control all of the signals that perform all functions in our body from the speech that I'm giving you right now or movement or storing memory. Um, that determines or categorizes the uh, disease, the uh, dementia. So in Alzheimer's disease, uh, the hippocampus, the area that's primarily responsible uh, for memory storage is one of the first areas where you see neuronal loss. Another similar characteristic that you see of these dementia is that there's this accumulation of these protein clumps in the brain areas that are affected and resulting in neuronal loss and symptoms. And these proteins normally have this very intricate, delicate structure that helps them have, help neurons perform their function in the brain. But for some reason, in these disease states, as you see on the right, for the example, for Alzheimer's disease, these proteins lose that structure and they begin to clump up. Um, and we see that in the areas of the brain that are affected and where neurons are lost. And that's where symptoms are then presented uh, in these dimensions. But with this knowledge, there's actually been some hope in the clinic for uh, dealing with dementia. Um, and treating it potentially. Um, as we've learned about these protein clumps that are accumulating, there have been medical imaging advances that where, as you see here, this is a screen of an image from a PET scan that specifically looks for those aggregated proteins within the brain of people currently living with Alzheimer's disease to help aid in the diagnosis. And also recently, in the Alzheimer's disease space, there has been a blood test approved for clinicians to help diagnose Alzheimer's disease. And it actually looks for that protein that clumps up in the brain uh, in Alzheimer's disease called amyloid beta. Um, and its detection in the blood can help inform and potentially diagnose a, a specific type of dementia, Alzheimer's disease. And there are currently no disease modifying treatments that can help improve cognition, but there have been recent reports in the press where we have seen some good news as we've learned from fast, past failures in clinical trials in dementias such as Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we're starting to see some potential positive uh, drugs coming through the clinic that could potentially be disease modifying. But I want to get back to things outside of the clinic that a dementia-friendly community could specifically impact. So there was an international panel of experts that came together, a dementia prevention team. And recently, they described and looked at all of the evidence in the field up to date. And what they concluded or they're estimating is almost 40% of dementia cases may be modifiable by lifestyle intervention and other things that don't require a drug. And 
that had, was broken down into early life stages, middle life stages, and late life stages. But some of these things I particularly want to highlight, if we look in the later life stage, um, facets like depression and social isolation, air pollution, these are factors that aren't just influenced potentially by one individual, but by a supportive community that could not only help people live better lives that currently have a diagnosis of dementia, but these data suggest that initiatives could also be taken to potentially prevent dementia or reduce the risk of dementia for people that don't yet have a diagnosis. So that's where I hope you can see the connection of where a dementia-friendly Hyde Park could greatly impact not only the people that are living with dementia right now in the community, but maybe those in the future as well. And through certain efforts that we can all take together in these different areas of our community, we can create a more equitable space for people living with dementia and their families and caregivers. So with that in mind, it brings me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Tom Doyle. So Tom is a representative um, of the Alzheimer's Association Early Stage Advisory Group. This is a group of individuals that are living with a diagnosis of dementia, but they are sharing their stories with people all over the country. And Tom is currently uh, a resident of Elgin with his husband, Levi, but I know that he views Hyde Park quite fondly, and, and I hope that he gets into that um, with his story. So with that, I will pass the baton over to Tom. Thank you, Wade. It's great to be with you all today. I don't know if you can tell, and I'm sure you can't, but I'm shaking. I'm not shaking totally out of nervousness, although speaking to such a large group can be nerve wracking, especially for a person living with dementia. But the shaking is because I've also been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. My name is Tom Doyle, and I have Lewy body dementia. I live with my husband, Levi, in Elgin, Illinois. A year ago, a year ago almost to this day, we were looking at apartments in Hyde Park because that was our favorite community in Chicago, but my family intervened and because they all live out in the Northwest suburbs, we moved out here to Elgin to be close to them so they could be a support to my husband. We've been together for 16 years and have been married for 12 years. He's not only my husband, but he's also my care partner. I also have three children, two boys and a girl from a previous marriage. Professionally, I've been a teacher, principal, superintendent, and university professor. Five years ago, I had an incredible career as a professor and university administrator. I was chair of the teacher education department, served as a faculty senator, and was on the Senate negotiating team working with administration on a new contract for faculty. But my greatest passion was teaching. I loved my students and received almost perfect scores on student evaluations. My life had purpose, meaning, and joy. But then my world was turned upside down. At that time, I was going to a psychologist and he noticed that I was losing words and repeating myself. I would also get lost in my sentences. He called in my husband and asked him if he noticed changes. Levi affirmed what the psychologist said. My psychologist recommended that I talk to my neurologist that I was seeing for my Parkinson's about the symptoms that I was demonstrating. My neurologist gave me a short memory test and diagnosed me with mild cognitive impairment. During this time, my anxiety began to rise. At home, my husband continued to notice a decline, 
I was losing words more and more and was forgetting things. He also noticed that I'd become disorganized and could not follow through on simple tasks in my home office as I prepared to teach and during the uh, teaching of online classes. The most devastating thing that happened though was I was no longer able to remember the lectures that I had given for years. Also during class, my students would ask me questions and I couldn't recall the answers to the questions. When asked a question, I would ask the students if they knew what the answer was. I could no longer grade papers efficiently. I would get lost in the middle of grading a paper and have to go back and begin <coughs> the grading again. I began to lose my ability to read. My student evaluation started to, to, to drop. Before I would teach, I would become so nervous that I would sometimes have panic attacks. I would script my classes so I could read verbatim my lectures. This was a drastic change for, I had always been extemporaneous. Eventually my psychologist recognized my rising anxiety and called me and Levi into his office and said that I couldn't go on like this. He said that the demands of my job were going to literally kill me and that I could no longer function on the job. So I met with the chairs of the teacher education department and told them what was happening and didn't think I could continue on the job. They each touched my arm as a gesture of compassion and said that I didn't need to come in anymore. On August 8th, 2015, I was employed in my dream job. And on August 9th, I was on full-time disability and retired. This was probably my darkest hour. I couldn't believe what was happening to me. This disease had robbed me of my sense of meaning, purpose, and joy. I began to go through the stages of grief during the first year and a half. I began to isolate. We moved from Long Beach, California, where we had lived for years to the desert because we could no longer afford to live in the city because my disability was so much less than my salary. My husband was going to school and I would sit at home alone, depressed and lonely. I no longer had my friends who were mostly my peers. At first, my colleagues from the university would call, but that stopped after about the first six months. They had moved on, but I hadn't and I didn't believe I could. Because of the move, I went to a new neurologist who diagnosed me with Lewy body dementia because of the symptoms that I was exhibiting. About that time, my incredible husband asked me if I would experience more support in Illinois since my family, father, brothers, nieces, and nephews lived in the Chicago area. I said yes, though I was leaving my daughter and one of my sons in Southern California and Levi was leaving all of his family. What a sacrifice he made. I had to find a sense of purpose elsewhere. My doctor put me in touch with the Illinois chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. I became very involved with the chapter. I attended both younger onset and early stage support groups. I began to tell my story of living with dementia to groups of people in a variety of different organizations, including second year medical students at the University of Illinois, Chicago. I was nominated and selected to serve on the National Alzheimer's Association Early Stage Advisory Group. I have had the incredible opportunity to share my story and the incredible work of the Alzheimer's Association with hundreds of pe people, including my Congresswoman in Washington, DC. Recently, I was nominated and elected and have served on the board of directors of the National Alzheimer's Association. From the very beginning, the Alzheimer's Association has given my life purpose, meaning, and joy. The work of the Alzheimer's Association is amazing. Research is being done to find a cure for this terrible disease and we are close. Great strides have been made in research to find ways of stopping the disease before the symptoms begin to show. The association has made, a, ma has made as one of its priorities the early detection of the disease that is so important for the treatment of the disease. The Alzheimer's Association also provides support to people living with all forms of dementia. 
I also have the most incredible team of doctors in Chicago at Northwestern Medicine. Integrated service is provided between my movement specialist neurologist, my memory specialist neurologist, my primary care physician, my psychiatrist and social worker. They are continually interacting with each other to provide me with the most comprehensive service and meet Levi and I where we're at. Sometimes even literally, like when a caseworker visited us at home to talk about state assistance we are eligible for. They have provided countless resources to Levi and me that would support us through this journey. So today I celebrate. I have reason to celebrate because I live a life of purpose, meaning and joy in good part due to the work of the amazing Alzheimer's Association and the compassion and care of my care team, uh, health professionals. I serve as a spokesperson for people who need to hear about what it's like to live with this disease. I celebrate you who have a passion for helping all people living with dementia to have healthy and fulfilling lives. My name is Tom Doyle. I have Lewy body dementia, but Lewy body dementia does not have me. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. That was fantastic. So inspiring. I don't even know why I gave the first part of the talk. Could have just been you. Thank you. And we so look forward to your input in understanding this dementia-friendly Hyde Park initiative. So with that, Thank you. I, I now want to introduce our second speaker. Tom mentioned uh, his husband, Levi, as, as a primary caregiver for him. And now I want to introduce Kelly Stepto Royston, who is a Hyde Parker and also a primary caregiver for a person in her life living with dementia. Kelly, I'll let you take it from here. Good evening, everyone. How are you? It is going to be very difficult to follow Tom. He is amazing. Um, my name is Kelly Steptoe Royston. Wade asked that I share some of my feelings and experiences as a caregiver with you. So I hope you don't mind. I jotted some of them down so I could read it to you. One, the, I'll tell you the first thing I've mentioned is that now that I'm a caregiver, time has become extremely precious to me. This is why I wanted to organize my thoughts so that they're very clear and very concise. Um, I'm a lifelong high parker. I live with my husband, Sheldon, and my mother, Barbara, who has dementia. I am my mom's caregiver. My mom has exhibited symptoms of dementia for a few years now. Her symptoms have incrementally progressed as time has passed. Initially, they were mild. She couldn't remember names, words escaped her. Now they're more severe. She's often confused, can't remember things. She doesn't recognize most of her family or friends, including myself. She's very unsure of things and extremely anxious. But I am fortunate. My mom and my dad, for that matter, were the absolute best. They always made sure I felt loved and safe and treasured. And as an only child, I knew that I'd take care of them when they got older and needed assistance. My dad passed away last year at the age of 90. So now all my focus is on making sure my mom's needs are taken care of. While trying to be a good wife, try to be sort of professional and a doggy mommy. I'm very lucky to have a strong support system, which includes my husband, who's very supportive and always willing to jump in with help, and Pat, who is a caregiver who comes over and takes care of my mom when I have to go to work. My mom is an exceptional woman. She was born and raised in New Orleans and moved to Chicago in her early 20s. Calling her bright is an understatement. She graduated from undergrad when she was 18 and graduate school when she was 20. This was while navigating racist Jim Crow laws as well as segregation in the South. As a graduate student, she was one of the first students to integrate Loyola University in New Orleans. She spent her entire career in education as a teacher, a, social, a school social worker, and then retiring as a principal. I share this not to just extol her virtues, even though, like I said, she's fantastic, but to also give additional perspective of the unique experience we're having. Not remembering things and the confusion she often feels is extremely frustrating for her. Do you have that friend who knows everything? That was my mom. If you were in a game show and you could phone a friend, my mom would be that friend. 
Being confused and not being able to recall things is very, very tough for her. It both angers her and saddens her, and sometimes at the same time. How do we navigate this? Basically, trial and error. We take everything one day at a time. And through this trial and error, I have come up with some rules to keep in mind while trying to keep peace in our home. My husband has nicknamed them Kelly's Commandments, and I thought I could share just a few of them with you this night, uh, tonight. So our first commandment is remember, it's the dementia. Sounds simple, but in the heat of the moment, it's easy to forget. These challenges we're going through are due to a medical condition. There are changes happening to my mom's brain. At home, we talk about dementia. We objectify it. When my mom can't remember something or is confused or anxious or, or short with me, I remember that this is because of the dementia. It's not my mom. And I talk about it with her often if she's having a tough time. Sharing with her why she is remembering things sometimes helps her in the moment. It's like she's relieved that there's a reason she isn't remembering these things. I don't know how long my mom will be cognizant enough to recognize this, but now I feel it often helps her cope in the moment. And I will say, separating her dementia symptoms from the woman who raised me definitely helps me cope. So like I said, remember, it's the dementia. Commandment number two, forgive. It's important to forgive yourself. Navigating life as a caregiver, especially to someone you love, brings challenges every day. As much as I'd like to tell you that I handle each day with grace, it is simply not true. Sometimes I may snap or lose my temper or just not be as kind as I should be. Um, sometimes I'm, I'm smelling in my feelings. I feel aggrieved and I react. Most of the time afterward, I immediately feel awful. I'll often have to take a moment to collect myself and get it together. Now, sometimes that moment I need to take can be pretty long. Time. One time, suffice it to say, I did not handle a situation with my mom with grace, and I was pretty frightened. I took some time for myself and then went to try to talk to her. I started off by simply saying, I'm sorry. And she looked at me with a funny expression and said, okay. I then shared with her why I reacted like I did and apologized for my behavior. And she looked me straight in the eye and said, what are you talking about, Kelly? By the time I came to apologize, she had forgotten about what happened. Such is the life of living with a person with dementia. When I was thinking about it later, I realized that I was beating myself up about how I handled a situation that my mom didn't even remember an hour or two later. The grace that I always tried to extend to others needed to be extended to myself as well. The thing is, I will mess up and make mistakes and do dumb things sometimes. And when I do, I'll do my best to learn the situation, try to do and be better, and apologize in a more timely manner. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can, and sometimes it's necessary to forgive myself. Forgive. The last commandment I'll share with you today is number three, prioritize myself. I was on a call with Wade and Dorothy, and they asked me something about myself. As I began to respond, I stopped mid-sentence because instead of answering a question about me, I was answering it on my mom's behalf, not my own. The thing is, stuff like this often happens. You look good for your age is a response that I've received more than once when I provided my 84-year-old mom's birth date instead of my own when I got my prescription at Walgreens. I have evenly, I've even mistakenly filled out personal paperwork at, at work on social security number. The thing is, when you're a caretaker, the person you care for becomes your priority. They are your focus. Sometimes after you take care of them or her or they, <sighs> sorry, I'm getting, um, once you take care of them, you, you don't remember to take care of yourself. A time to take care of yourself. You have to do this. You have to. I know everyone knows this, but actually doing it is the challenge. Something I do to prioritize my needs is make sure that every day I do something for my mind, something for my body, and something for my soul. Now, 
The key to this is that it doesn't have to take a lot of time. Making this commitment to myself really makes a difference. Doing something for my mind could be reading an article about Alzheimer's. Doing something for my body could actually be working out on this elliptical that's right here that's collecting dust. Doing something for my soul could be laying on the couch watching reruns when everyone's asleep. Making myself a priority and doing things for myself makes me feel more fulfilled and validated. And when I feel good, I am able to be a better caregiver to my mom. Prioritize yourself. I learned about the Chicago High Park Village as well as High Park becoming the first dementia-friendly community in Chicago from an article in the High Park Herald. I immediately contacted Dorothy and asked how I could help. Being a caregiver to someone with dementia comes with its own special challenges. And I was elated. I was elated to learn about this community of people who are open to advocating and supporting those with dementia as well as their caregivers. Sometimes as a caregiver, you can feel alone. Like, like no one understands your challenges and what you're going through. Hopefully hearing about my experiences will let you know that you are not alone. There are others who can empathize with your struggles and there are resources available to help you. The Chicago High Park Village provides many of these from transportation to medical advocacy to neighborhood referrals. Take advantage of them and take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was wonderful. I so appreciate you sharing your story. And I love for Dementia Friendly Hyde Park, you've laid out the template already. You have your commandments. And I think if we think about those in what we're trying to do with the community, I think we're going to go a long way with this. So thank you once again. So finally, uh, I want to introduce our final member of our panel, uh, Tessa McEwen. As we've heard about the caregiving support system that is around someone living with dementia, this is where Tessa comes in from a more uh, professional perspective. She is a social worker at the Memory Center working with people and families that are living with dementia. So Tessa, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. Good to see you. Um, before I start, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as well. And yeah. All right. Good. All right. So. Good evening, good evening, everyone. I just wanted to um, introduce myself and, and as a partner with the Chicago Hyde Park Village, we are also representing the Memory Center and Share Network Chicago. Um, Jason Maloney and I are the medical sector co-leads for this Dementia Friendly Hyde Park initiative. And together with the Chicago Hyde Park Village, want to uh, welcome you all and are excited to be here with you all. Um, as Wade was mentioning, I am the medical social worker for the Memory Center. And what I do is I really walk alongside families from diagnosis onward throughout their course of their, uh, their journey. And Share Network Chicago is a full service resource directory and a portal for events and activities related to dementia care and outreach and education in the South, throughout the South Side of Chicago. And really, I want us to come away from this whole event with a heart-centered feel of what are we doing here in our community? We are wanting to lead with dignity for those living with dementia. We want to enhance our collective quality of lives, whether you're a care partner Hi. or someone who is living with dementia. And we want to, as neighbors, look out for one another, right? We are here representing every sector, libraries, schools, first responders, businesses, and medical entities, and more. And you know, we're really so excited to have this opportunity to really feel like we are an inclusive neighborhood, no matter who we are, and no matter what we look like, and no matter what our cognitive, cognitive abilities are. And as we speak, as we go through the rest of this evening, we are welcoming all of your ideas. We invite you to share your ideas in the chat. 
how can we make the subtlest parts of our neighborhood that much more welcome to those living with, with dementia? And some practical considerations I want us to think about is, yes, we want to lead with dignity. We want to put ourselves in the shoes of one who might be experiencing this. We want to prepare early. Let's look out for the signs and symptoms. And when we know that we are having someone in our family or care team that has a condition that has cognitive impairment, let's um, do what we can to learn how to prepare our care. What kind of living environment do we need to arrange for? What are our finances like? What kind of safety preparations do we need to consider? And how can we learn how to communicate more effectively with one another when a person has these symptoms of cognitive impairment? The more we learn from all the resources I'm gonna share with you and the more that the Dementia Family Hyde Park um, Initiative can share, we, are, we will be so much more equipped to find that way to be more compassionate with one another along the way. So that's why priority number five is really let's help our neighbors have an enhanced quality of life. We want to help them build in rest, support, recreation. So in other words, what kind of exciting events can we put on to enhance quality of life? What kind of um, programs can we put so that we can assist our care partners, right? And relief and rest for everyone because sleep is so precious and that we know that with this condition, we lose a lot of sleep. So here I want to just show you why does this matter? You know, why does this matter in our neighborhood? It matters because I want us to think of our brain like a bookshelf. We have a brain that is full of capacity. And when we are having a, symptoms of dementia, the part of our brain that is, has retained short-term memories, has the ability to cook, clean, drive, think for ourselves and um, remember um, these things that happened recently may be missing on the bookshelf. Right. And so we genuinely don't know that we repeated at this moment. We genuinely didn't know where we put that item. Um, but look at the bottom of the bookshelf. It's quite full where we actually detect emotion. We feel everything so we can still feel love and hope and connection. We want to capitalize on that opportunity with one another. We really want to connect and make the person feel safe because, as you can imagine, with these missing books on the shelf, it is quite unsettling to be in the body of someone with, with dementia, right? There's, um, if we feel every emotion, if we can feel love and, and, um, and connection, we can also feel fear, stress, and embarrassment. So our hope is to really help the person feel safe and warm and included. It's a very isolating experience. How do we make someone feel included? I have an example in my, um, when I was meeting with a family, they came over and the patient himself said, yes, yes, I don't know what I just said. I don't know what I just did, but I see you looking at me funny. Why? Because in the bottom of the bookshelf, not only do we retain emotion, uh, we retain the detection of body language, words, and tone. So he saw the energy and it made him feel unsafe. Um, similarly, another patient called me and said, you know, I was going through the drive through and I was really struggling with the menu and it was very stressful to me and the person on the other end and the speaker was just saying, hurry, hurry, hurry. And um, I kept telling them, I, I'm really struggling. I'm not fooling you. I have a little bit of a memory problem. And I just felt so embarrassed and so defeated and, and dumb, you know, and there's other people who get lost in the grocery right, or have trouble navigating the bank and are vulnerable with cash in their hands, um, getting lost on the street. And so why do we need a dementia-friendly community? Because we want to help educate one another to pay attention to this and be sensitive and mindful when we notice this in our, amongst our neighbors. And therefore, we want to train our first responders and our staff and our um, everyone around us. So, here we are. These are our lives, right? All of us are juggling many things all at once. And um, especially when we're caring for someone with dementia, we don't have, you don't have to be alone. We are here for the person caring and for the person experiencing it. 
And therefore, for example, just representing the memory center, for example, what we can do practically, if you notice symptoms within your family, within your neighborhood, um, feel free to contact um, a local medical facility. So for example, locally here in the neighborhood, uh, the memory center can do a diagnostic workup. We can do the physical exam, the MRI, cognitive assessment, a lab workup, neuropsychological testing. You know, um, it is led by Dr. Mastriani, who is, uh, we, we all are Hyde Parkers. I've lived here for over 10 years and Dr. Mastriani lives around the corner, you know, so he knows Hyde Park. We are Hyde Park and we are part of this community really wanting to make sure that people understand what the diagnosis is, which form of dementia is it, and then we provide ongoing care for over time. So we have um, the South Shore Senior Center site is where we come every Monday and Wednesdays and Fridays. We're here at the local medical center on campus. And once Dr. Mastriani completes the diagnosis, then I'm partnered with you to walk alongside your journey full of the resources you need. And in between visits, that's when we have a nurse and a nurse practitioner supporting the symptoms along the way. Um, and then entities like Share Network Chicago continues with events and, and engagement and education. Another thing that I wanted to share with you some marquee programming that we've already gotten started in partnership with Share Network, with Hyde Park Village. Um, one thing that the Memory Center has been doing over the last, uh, we're coming up on 10 years next year, is we've had a art program that services all of the Memory Center patients, whoever wants to. It was started as a Saturday weekly program, but it evolved into a pandemic relief program that is actually getting into the mail this week. So we are actually making this um, a tech-free at-home experience and it is going to scale. People who are interested, what you will receive is a professionally curated handmade art kit in the mail that comes weekly to your home delivered completely, no charge to you. For those interested, you visit our website and just um, sign up. And so we want to bring these kinds of programs to Hyde Park and make enhance your experience. Another one that um, we did is probably the first partnership amongst Share Network Chicago and the Chicago Hyde Park Village was the first Chicagoland dementia friendly river cruise. And this was a brand new vessel, fully glass top. It was only, it was one of the first ADA accessible boats in um, Chicago. And we had 140 attendees MDs, a music therapist, art on, on, on the vessel, and um, thankfully with Share Network Chicago and, and Chicago Hyde Park Village, we had free transportation for those who wanted to attend. And this idea came up because it was one of our patients too, one who said, Tessa, I'm going on a dementia-friendly cruise. And you know, what happened was that there was a woman named Kathy Schof who had become, she was a geriatric nurse and she wanted more enhanced quality of life events for those living with, with dementia. And that is the inspiration here. We want to bring more events like this into our neighborhood. And what that includes is training, right? So here's a little bit of a picture of what, how, how that looked. But most important, this is a sample training the um, Kathy came and trained the boat staff, but this is an example of how we want to train our neighbors and the businesses, first responders, right? I want to show you that some of these things are just little nuggets of tips for our local um, staff and all the businesses and, and groceries around us. So it's like saying thank you for your, your awareness, patience, and compassion, educating them that dementia may impair memory and language skills and visual capabilities. And so um, you can see from these bullet points, some of them are just giving tips for staff, like um, approach them from the front, make eye contact, maintain a kind voice and give one direction at a time, offer to help rather than pointing. So these are the kinds of trainings that we can think about for our, our local businesses and, and uh, community members. And that's what we are wanting to um, bring to our neighborhood. And these are some testimonials um, from the experience. Okay. And I'm hoping that anyone who's interested will probably get these slides. I just want to give a sample of the kinds of things that our very rich community of um, dementia friendly Hyde Park can offer and care 
through uh, ongoing care planning with uh, the memory center. So for example, we in, in care planning for dementia, we want to help you get access to what does that care planning look like? Do we, what are the free resources out there? What are the ways that we can organize as caregivers? Um, what kind of med reminder programs out there? What kind of safety things do we need to look into? Um, what kind of transportation alternatives are there, right? So with all the symptoms, we can think about how to make life a little bit easier and we can do this together as a neighborhood. Um, what are the ways that we can plan if we need to adjust our living situation and plan our finances? Tessa, I think Tessa's frozen. It's not just me, right? Tessa's frozen. Anyone else hear her? No, I can't hear her. Yeah, Tessa's no, frozen. It sounds like here, Tessa. Yeah. yeah, I think she's frozen. All right. Um, let's see. Okay. Well. Um, all right, and now Tessa is not in the meeting. Okay. She'll probably be getting back on fairly soon. Um, I think uh, we we are running a little behind. Uh, we had hoped to be kind of done with the presentations about 10 minutes ago. So um, I think what we'll do right now, and I'm so sorry, when Tessa gets on here, we'll let her kind of just wrap up. Um, but Wade, why don't we go ahead and start and kind of jump into the questions. Um, we're going to end promptly at 7.30, so we'll have uh, 30 minutes for questions. We want to thank everyone once again for being here. I, I'm so grateful for the panelists and everyone who spoke. Um, it was really, really great information um, and great to hear from them. So what we'll do is we'll start for you know, upwards of maybe five to 10 minutes of some of the questions that were asked in advance. Um, and then you can um, raise your hand um, if you would like to make a question or comment. Um, additionally, just really quickly, um, there is a, uh, a poll. If you, um, yes, there will be a brief poll shortly. Um, and essentially, just to, to give you a little bit of uh, quick um, background to the poll, um, the Chicago High Park Village currently has a visitor program called Village Vill Visitors that connects caring volunteers to older adults for about one hour a week. And they're considering alternative models to better address those needs of people living with dementia and their caregivers. Um, and they want to get your feedback on how long a shift a volunteer would be willing to work during the day, evening, or weekend. Um, and I think your options are one hour, two hours, three hours, a half day, and a full day. So once that poll pops up, um, uh, you can, yeah. and there it is. Um, so if you can go ahead and just um, select which one. Uh, while we are getting to the questions, uh, I'm sure the, the info and the data that uh, we get from that is going to be very beneficial. So thank you in advance. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Wade to start off, us off with the questions. Great. Uh, one question I can quickly answer from the chat. Yes, we will be uh, posting the slides that were presented, especially with Tessa, with all of the wonderful resources and kickstarting our ideas for these efforts. Um, we have from the Chicago High Park Village website, um, there is a specific website dedicated to Dementia Friendly Hyde Park. Um, and we will drop that link uh, in the chat um, as well as reiterated at the end of this conversation. But one of the, one of the first questions I would like to get to that, that was pre-submitted, um, I would like to ask Tom this question. Uh, when is it appropriate to open a discussion with someone when you may see that they're exhibiting signs of dementia? Tom, I would really appreciate your perspective um, as, as you think back to when you first started showing symptoms. How would you feel in that situation? I um, was frustrated already because I was starting to see changes in myself. And I noticed that one of the questions in the chat box was from someone who identified herself as 80 years old and is starting to have trouble and it's bothering her. Um, as soon as I started to have difficulty, 
I started to um, have, I, I talked to my husband and he validated the fact that I was struggling. Um, and then um, I think the most important thing is to get an early diagnosis because an early diagnosis sets you up for treatment and so my suggestion is, if you think you're having memory problems, go to a neurologist and have that neurologist, particularly one who's a memory specialist, um, provide you with a set, set of tests and questions and get into an integrated kind of health, health program that would enable you to get the kind of support services that you need. But early detection is something that we are really big on. And, and that's so important because again, treatment is tailored to the type of disease that you have. And the treatment can certainly help and support you and encourage you as you are struggling with the different issues that are starting to come up in your life. Thank you so much, Tom, for that answer. Um, I saw that Tessa was, was able to hop back on. Um, so Tessa, I would like to ask the, the same question to you um, with your perspective um, from the clinical side and your story in talking about how, how a patient you know, was embarrassed when, when they started um, in the fast food line and they had a negative experience. Um, when do you view as an appropriate time to discuss with a community member if they may be exhibiting symptoms of dementia? It is so tough. I think it really is depending on the family and the person. Usually the per, um, if the person themselves who is exhibiting the symptoms uh, naturally lacks insight into their impairment, that is very possible. The person, because it's a memory condition, the person may genuinely not know that they have a problem. Um, sometimes the care partner or the family member may mention that, oh, I noticed this, do you notice this as well? Often the person is noticing it deep inside without, without expressing it. And Unfortunately, it often what I see a lot in our charts are that it, these symptoms go on for a few years before until something has to happen, like an event or an accident, where they finally say it's the last straw, let's go to the doctor, you know, so I think it really it's tough. It's, I think the more we normalize this, I think that's why we're here, the more we normalize the and and, and put out what the symptoms are, then we can have people who are interested in getting assessed early and often. And I think that's why it's really great too that the Dementia Friendly Hyde Park site has this early screening tool or you, for yourself to check and then decide, maybe I do wanna get checked out. And knowing for yourself that once we get an evaluation, um, we can, do things early on and it's lifestyle. We can uh, really enhance your lifestyle as early as possible. Great, thanks. I, I appreciate that, Tessa. And, and from seeing the complexities as you talked about the emotions of, of these diseases and how that can make this conversation hard for different people. And from your perspective, Tom, I, I appreciate you guys sharing that insight into maybe how we approach that. And I love this idea of normalizing these things within our community. And I think that's steps we all can take, even, even coming out of this meeting. Um, the, the second question I think I can ask, open to all three of you, maybe I'll start with Kelly, um, thinking about the realities of, of our current situation. So how, how has COVID affected your you know, daily life as a, as a caregiver and dealing with your mother and getting access to resources and things like that. And how could things be designed in the community or, you know, how could people volunteer to maybe help out with some of those challenges? Um, well, it's kind of funny because as I mentioned before, my mom does live with us. Um, and 
when COVID came, uh, one of the things we do is we try to make sure that we have a very positive environment um, because my mom had, doesn't remember things. She's often, she's really living in the moment. Uh, so we make sure that we don't have the news on because news can be very depressing. We make sure we have music or the game show no network or something like that. Uh, so the reason I bring that up is to say she didn't really happening initially. She didn't realize that, that there was this pandemic and that, you know, we, we, she did notice that masks were coming around a little bit more, but she didn't realize what was going on. What she did realize was, was that I was working from home and she was elated about that. So interestingly, um, COVID in the world is blowing up, but my mom is very contented right now because I'm home all the time, uh, as well as my husband and we can play with the doggies and, and we were having a, a quote unquote, a, a nice time. Um, I work for the city, so I had to return uh, to work um, probably a little bit before many other people. And that's when things, uh, she, she started to get a little upset. Um, how that really has affected us is that uh, one, um, we do not do many things at all outside the house um, because my mom is 84 years old. Um, she does have some, um, some conditions, um, diabetes and such. Um, so we don't leave the house. And that's something that we often did do. Um, we realized that we don't, um, we, we would do things like take my mom for drives or we would you know um, try to go for walks when her arthritis isn't too bad. All these things we just stopped doing. So uh, a lot of the, the interaction with other people, um, all the, uh, the socialism, uh, seeing her, one of her best friends uh, lives six, seven blocks away and she has not seen her best friend since March 12th of last year. That's the last time we did because that was, uh, my godfather's birthday. Um, so that's made her upset. One of the things I've also noticed is that since she's not socializing with these people, she is not remembering them as well anymore, which is a, a really sad side effect. Um, things that could, that would help her a little bit more. Um, we are in a very fortunate situation that I have a very strong support system, which I kind of alluded to earlier, um, with regard to going places and taking her to doctor's appointments and so on and so forth. If I'm unable to do it, um, then my husband generally can do it. Um, but things that may be a little bit more helpful it, uh, would be, you know, getting groceries. Um, I um, get Mariano sometimes and uh, um, they will do delivery. Those things would be helpful. Um, with regard to socializing, again, we we live in a, a, a loud house. There's dogs barking, there's music playing, there's lots of going on. So um, we may be a little bit different than other people's um, situations. Uh, but I, I guess things that just make life a little bit easier because we can't go out taking advantage of those things. Like I said, delivery. Um, um, I'm, again, able to take her to doctor's appointments, but I do know that she has friends that were not able to do that. And that would be something that we really look forward to as well. Um, and, you know, something which I know the High Park Village has done, um, we are trying to connect with our family via Zoom and teaching her how to do Zoom, or she's, I'm not going to teach her how to do Zoom, I apologize, I misspoke, but making her understand, or helping her understand, rather, that my cousins are here, and because Zoom is just a whole different thing, like, we're looking at the people, we're talking to them, but they're not here, how is this happening, and I know the High Park Village kind of addressed that, and did a class with Zoom as well, and things like that would be really beneficial, I think, to people in situations similar to my mom's. Great, Kelly. Thanks so much for that insight. And I love some of those ideas. And I love that you highlighted some of these um, efforts can be done through some of the initiatives through Chicago Hyde Park Village. So if people want to volunteer or are interested, I, I would again direct people to the website, um, chpv.org slash DFHP, Dementia Friendly Hyde Park. And you'll see a tab where you can uh, sign up to be a volunteer. Um, or go to the main page, chpv.org, if you're interested in any of those initiatives. Um, so that, that's what we had for the prepared questions. I will hand it back over to Ali now uh, to help and hopefully hear from you all, uh, whether it be in the chat or raising your hand with the reaction button that you see at the bottom of your screen. Yes, thank you, Wade. And if you cannot see the reaction button, 
Um, that's okay. I struggled with even being able to tell it to everybody. So for those of you with your feed on, if you can't find it, raise your hand. We'll do our best to get to you um, in, in the screen. Uh, I want to welcome first our first participant um, who'd like to share some thoughts and a question. Uh, we have Phylin Crawford. Um, here, our um, immediate past president, uh, President Emeritus of the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference. Uh, welcome, Phylin. Thank you, Ali. Uh, this has been a great forum already, very good information. Um, last fall, I decided to become a de dementia friend after meeting with Dorothy Pytel from the Chicago Hyde Park Village. She explained her work with the Hyde Park Village and their efforts to make Hyde Park a dementia-friendly neighborhood. <laughs> I was interested in learning more. The, the Dementia Friends program, program taught me to be aware of certain behaviors among my peers, people in my parents' age group, and people that I encounter in business. One of the surprising things that I found out about dementia is that many people living with dementia are independent adults. So in my mind, uh, people who were living with dementia were probably disabled adults who were not very active. and Today, I met Tom a couple hours ago. He has kind of disabused me of that notion. And uh, I was glad to know that. And, uh, and, and in everything that Tessa was saying, I learned a lot in those slides that she was sharing. So um, maybe Tom can just say a little bit more about just being an, an independent adult living with dementia and just letting us, educating us more on that. Well, uh, I'm gonna go back to the last question too and answering that isolation is typical of us who live with dementia. Um, when we realize that we're having problems, we tend to separate ourselves from other people. And so isolation though is no friend to us who have dementia. And so it's in extremely important that there is someone who is reaching out to, to those of us who have dementia. Uh, the LGBTQ community has been struck with dementia just like all the other communities. But the LGBT community, there's a lot of us who are not living with anyone and so are living alone. And that's kind of frightening. Um, but life, life um, is more challenging now that we are in the COVID because there is a tendency to isolate and so some of the things that are very helpful are making sure I stay in touch with my friends from the Alzheimer's Association. Those of us who have the disease stay in constant contact. Um, there's programs through the Alzheimer's Association where um, you can become a part of a support group with other people who are living with dementia. And that's really helpful too. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, Filene. It does, yeah, Filene, yeah, it does, it does. Filene, that, 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 that was, yeah, Filene. That's okay. Yeah, that was very helpful in, in thinking about a support group of people who have family members with dementia. That, that's a good idea too. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Filene, and thank you, Tom. Um, there's another question in the chat from Claudia Cook, um, and she's asking what type of volunteer opportunities are there if I can't be there physically? And I'll open the floor up. Maybe I'll jump in there and just quickly introduce myself. I'm Dorothy Pytel from the Chicago Hyde Park Village. Uh, and I'm very excited to be here. We have lots of um, opportunities and particularly the question about if you can't be there physically, a lot of really organizing a community really can be done over the phone, via email. So it's very conducive to, to working during the pandemic. In fact, when we started this um, initiative, we were sort of stimmied because we started organizing about a month or two before the pandemic hit and then you couldn't do anything, but the, um, the, the national network as well as the Illinois network um, for dementia friendly um, communities really encouraged us to continue. So we, we just um, started re doing outreach, doing some, uh, you know, filing our application. Uh, and so it's really very, po it's actually a wonderful time to do organizing because you can do that even, you know, from the comfort of your own home. 
So uh, we do have on that page, that's uh, the chpv.org uh, backslash uh, D, uh, the FHP, there's information at the bottom of that page, how to contact me. So that way we can um, get you on board as a, as a volunteer. So if you're interested, um, let us know. We also um, have, if you're interested, opportunities uh, to visit and, and to, talk, to work on things that like Tom alluded to, the social isolation. We have a program called Village Visitors. It's the one that you filled the poll about. Um, you know, we're hoping at some point we'll be beyond the pandemic and we'll be able to resume um, in-person visits. But, you know, you can do uh, fairly safely even in-person visits if you walk, for instance, with someone uh, outdoors. Uh, so, you know, that's an alternative even during the pandemic. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dorothy. Um, and thank you for being here. And thank you for organizing this forum with us. Um, so are there any other uh, live questions? And, and if not, that's fine. We have some other pre-prepared questions, but I want to make sure that anybody who has a question now um, can feel free to ask. Okay. I, I just wanted to say one thing. Um, yes, Tom if you don't mind, Please. Um, when a question is asked by someone in the group, I forget what the question is as I'm starting to share with you a little bit about what my answer would be. And so those of us who have dementia really do better when we have both a visual and also an auditory um, because it's hard to remember. My short-term memory is very poor and so to ask a question of a person who has dementia and expect them sometimes to give you an answer that's cogent um, might be difficult, might be difficult. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. No, I think that's, I think that's very helpful, helpful for me also to keep in mind. Um, and I guess what we can do is if we can, if we're going to go to the, based on your suggestion, Tom, what we can do is if we go to the pre-prepared -pre questions and we have a good five or six minutes left, uh, we can try to put it in the chat as well. Um, so Wade, do you want to go to a couple of our questions that we have left? Yes, I am typing it in the chat right now. Um, so we'll, we'll start off with Kelly to kind of re reiterate a, a theme that, that's been pervasive throughout the night. But Kelly, if you could condense it down to, you know, one idea or a couple ideas, what is the best way to describe the benefits of a dementia-friendly community? The best way to benefit. I guess, you know, we just have to look at our personal situations. Um, I know I talked about ours and I talked about being unique because it is unique. The experience that my mom is having is different than Tom is having, is different than uh, one of my neighbors is having. So really um, look at the situation. And one of the things I do is, I'll be brief because I know we have a couple minutes, is I kind of look at it as, as a paradigm shift. Like my mom is not remembering things. She may repeat things. She'll be a little bit confused. Um, but what I do is I try to figure out what it is she's, what it is she's looking for. Like she, she may be repeating the same thing, but why is she doing it? I have to start thinking about not exactly what she's saying, but what is it that she needs? What is it that she wants? So how to take advantage of it would be literally just to kind of look at your situation and just try to plug in the holes. Um, for us, like I said, we're a little bit unique um, because my husband works from home most of the time and I uh, go into work on the other days. So we often, we tend to have someone here most of the time, but knowing that uh, our community is one that is empathetic to what we're going through is something that really makes a big difference. Um, and uh, one of the, the resources that for me, I think we would be able to take advantage of um, 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 more in the near future would literally be the, uh, 
the, the medical advocacy, listening to what Tess was saying about the memory center. My mom goes to the UFC and she's at the geriatric center on 71st street. And we may be at the point where we want to look into the memory center. And that would be something that learning about all of these, uh, all of these resources they have would be really beneficial for us. So looking at our situation and then plugging it in and seeing what they have there. Wonderful. Thank you. Really appreciate that insight. Um, Tom, I would, I would love if you could um, give, give your insight as well. I'm putting the question back in the chat box. Um, for you, what is the best way to describe the benefits of a dementia-friendly community? A dementia-friendly community provides resources to us who have dementia. Um, it's a community where people are informed about dementia and the kinds of things that we who have dementia deal with on a daily basis. Um, it's, it's always interesting to me. I had a person recently at a restaurant downtown say to me, I was at an Alzheimer's event and I said, well, I have Alzheimer's. And she looked at me and she said, you don't look like you have Alzheimer's. And I think what happens is we often expect to see a person who is very aged, who is continually confused, and we come in all shapes and sizes. And I think that that's really important for us to remember. Um, I've also had experiences, I had an experience in a hospital where uh, they did a DAT scan on me and left me in the room to change my clothes and said, you can leave. Well, I walked out in the hallway and I didn't know where I was. And I became immediately frightened. Um, and so you also have to know that some of us experience fear and anxiety when we're in a situation that's new or that's um, uncommon for us. But that was a devastating experience for me because I was scared. It took me five minutes to find somebody. And by that time I was completely panicked. Um, I, got, I got lost one time in a hotel for an Alzheimer's event and just panicked. Um, so those of us who experience um, dementia have extreme anxiety at times. And so anytime you can help us to become less anxious, that's really important. I have to tell them sometimes at a, at a store where I'm asking for information to slow down. And I, I have no problem saying I have dementia and you're gonna have to slow it down. Um, and so those are just a couple of things that I have noticed. I don't know if that's helpful, Wade. Yes, in incredibly helpful. And I'm actually seeing something in the chat. Um, thank you, Gwen. Um, you know, just that awareness, like you're saying, Tom, the question was, would it be helpful for businesses to post a symbol indicating that it is dementia friendly? Having the symbol would indicate that they're training their staff. Absolutely, that would be tremendous. Um, those of us who have dementia um, struggle at times when we go into a store, um, we might become confused and so forth. And so it's it would be very helpful if someone had a sign in the window that said, this is a dementia friendly business. Um, so that those of us who have dementia can feel comfortable going in there. And also it would be a place where um, those who are care partners, my husband would love to go into a store that said, this is a dementia friendly um, uh, uh, place of business. So I think that it would be a great idea. And I think that the Hyde Park Association has a great opportunity to do that um, because of the, that you're the vanguards. You are, you are setting the stage for what it means to be a dementia friendly community. And so you can start dealing with your businesses to help them to understand dementia and what we experience. Awesome, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Wade. Um, all right, everybody. Uh, well, we are going to wrap up um, with our final comment and question. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. 
Um, and what I want to do, um, I'm going to have a few closing comments, but before then, I would love to pass it over to Dorothy Pytel uh, with some closing remarks. So take it away, Dorothy. Great. Thanks so much, Ali. Um, as we wrap up um, this kickoff event, um, I just hope you really enjoyed hearing the various perspectives of a caregiver, a researcher, a social worker, and a person living with dementia. Um, we are, uh, at the Chicago Hyde Park Village on behalf of the Dementia Friendly Hyde Park Initiative are creating uh, what Tessa called um, a one-stop shop, uh, this webpage that we've put in the chat uh, several times. Um, and you could probably just Google Dementia Friendly Hyde Park and you'll probably get there as well. But what we're putting on there is information um, with links. For instance, there's a, um, a, a way to schedule a screening for yourself if you'd like, it's 15 minutes. Um, and you, it's a real appointment with a real person that you can schedule. Um, there's links to great organizations in the community that are doing things like the Memory Center. If you can, you don't have to worry about finding their website. If you go to the Dementia Friendly webpage, you can find them on there and then click to them. And then right on there, you can find out about how to get an appointment. We have information about volunteering, um, either the, our Village Visitors Program, um, the uh, Fai Lin mentioned the Dementia uh, Friends Program. There's information how to do training there. And Kelly, uh, one of the speakers tonight, um, is going to be, she is getting trained as a dementia champion. Um, and so she will be doing actual um, over Zoom a little bit more longer um, dementia uh, friend trainings as well. So those are uh, our ongoing opportunities. As soon as we have dates available, we'll post it there. Um, it, you know, there was that question about how do you, you know, volunteer during the time of a pandemic when it's difficult to do things in person. Organizing, again, I will mention is extremely easy to do and uh, conducive to this kind of an environment. Um, we have information by topics there. We have, in, uh, we'll, we'll have upcoming events. So coming soon, uh, Wade is organizing the scientists uh, in community to give regular um, sort of quarterly uh, educational uh, sessions about dementia. So that'll be uh, listed there as well. Um, we've got some projects in the works. Uh, we'd love to do a first responder training and just even doing this event, we had a response from uh, a Chicago police uh, officer who said, Hi, what can the police do? So I already have an email for a police officer that I will be reaching out to shortly. Um, and there, if, if there were some call or some questions about whether uh, how people from Lakeview, for instance, registered or from Barrington on this call, uh, how did they get their own community uh, involved? Uh, there is in Illinois, a wonderful network. Um, we do uh, phone calls once a, a month together. We share resources. So for instance, if we're gonna do a first responder training, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Other communities like Orland Park and Westmont have already done that. And so they are willing to share their resources and we can do that. So, um, you know, that's just wonderful. These are the kinds of uh, things. Um, and well, I love the question about the decal. We are actually, that's one of the other projects that we hope to do is to create a logo for this initiative and then to give it to businesses once they have, um, you know, uh, done some level of training that we still have to sort of prepare. A lot of those resources already exist. It's just about putting it together. So again, uh, chpv.org backslash uh, DFHP. And all you have to do is go there and then you can get a hold of a lot of other resources. And thank you so much for being here this evening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dorothy. Um, and I really want to say on behalf of uh, the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, we have been doing these community dialogues and these forums for the better part of the entire last year. Um, and maybe I shouldn't pick favorites, but I have loved this forum tonight. Thank you all so much. I'm so honored and happy to have been here. Um, I want to share the results of the poll real quickly before we end. Um, thank you, Barbara, uh, for sharing those. Um, so as you can see, the, the polling results were just shared. It looks like we had about 48% um, of you. Thank you so much for, for filling this out, who said that two hours would be, uh, you'd be willing to work as a, as a member. And then um, we had about 26% three hours, 22% one hour, and then 4% a half day. I think this is gonna be very um, uh, useful information for the Chicago Hyde Park Village. 
Um, and so finally, in wrapping up, I do want to thank all of our speakers. Thank you, Wade. Um, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you, Tom. Um, I want to thank um, the Chicago Hyde Park Village, Michelle Dassinger and Dorothy Pytel. Um, I want to thank Phylin Crawford, um, our past board president of HPKCC. Um, and uh, I want to thank last but not least, Barbara Breno Paschal. She is a board member. She uh, was the uh, HPKCC logo for the better part of this um, forum. Uh, she runs all the technical stuff in the background. Um, she, she makes the magic happen behind the curtain. Thank you, Barbara. Um, you are our rock. Thank you. So um, with that being said, um, and if you want to learn more about uh, Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference, you want to get involved, you can go to www.hydepark.org. Uh, we'd love to have you as a member follow us on Facebook, look forward to our future community dialogues as well. Once again, everyone, thank you all so much and have a wonderful night. Thank you all. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.